my good friend, Anat Kalor. Uh, I'm so happy to speak with you. I always learn new things. I'm going to learn something new today. Um, Anat, a, a, a significant number of patients coming into my office come in with, with dry eye. Actually, I'm probably oversimplifying things here. They, 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 they come in with symptoms of, of dry eye, or you know, better yet, better yet. A patient will, 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 will come in and say, my husband saw you six months ago, husband's not there. He's got dry eye symptoms. What, what can I do about it? It's easy to make a diagnosis of uh, dry eye over the phone, right? That's right. So you hit on a very good question, which is, is it or is it not dry eye? And it turns out we throw, away this, throw around this term dry eye like it's one entity, and we know it's not. And so when a patient comes in with dry eye symptoms, what we need to do is figure out, is it dry eye or not? And the way we do that is with a standardized exam. First, we ask about symptoms, and we're trying to understand what is it that the patient is truly complaining of. And you understand when you start asking that, that there's actually lots of different complaints that fall under this umbrella. So sometimes it's dryness, but other times it's burning, itching, and sometimes it's poor quality vision. And so then you're like a detective, right? Your job is to figure out why are they having these symptoms. Why do I care? Why, why, why does it matter? Uh, you wh care which, because which you are an excellent no, I, physician. I'm but not, also, um, yes. <laughs> you care because if you don't figure out what's underlying the symptoms, you're going to be throwing a kitchen sink at them, and you're going to be frustrated, and they're going to be frustrated, right? And you want happy patients. And so if you have a stepladder approach that works for your practice, every practice has to find their own approach to get a quick but systematic way of what underlies symptoms. So I was going to give you my quick yeah, no, approach. No, 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 I want to hear, but uh, just, to, just to understand what the, the, the underlying premise is here. It's that these, the, the, the description of the patient's symptoms and what you're going to describe uh, diagnostically is going to lead me along paths to different pathologies, which then prompt different treatment paradigms. Is, is that I mean, is that where that is we're going that with this? That is the premise. Okay, so I mean that that okay. So so tell me how I get to that to that payoff of of developing the correct therapy for for my patient. So your exam is going to start as you walk in the room, because one of the things you're looking for is anatomical issues, right? And so if you're looking for things like poor blink and exposure, you see that before you even get to the slit lamp. And then I like to subtype dry eye into five categories. The first one is the Sjogren's-like aqueous tear deficiency with inflammation. The next one is the lid margin associated dry eye. The next one is abnormal anatomy, like conjunctivocalasis, like abnormal lid anatomy. The next one is abnormal nerves. And in that, I have two. I have neuropathic pain, where the nerves are sensing pain. But the other aspect is neurotrophic keratitis, where the nerves are not sensing pain. So I combine that into kind of four and five. So and the, the, yeah, oh. how, no, no, no. I, I, and so I, I, the I case, but, yes. but to make it more complex, the case I presented yesterday, my patient actually had a touch of all four of those. And that kind of highlights the complexity of saying it really is more than one thing, but you have to have a stepladder approach and address the different contributors. And I generally start with the one that's most prominent and go down the list. Yes, how, how do I do this? How do I, how do I work my way through the algorithm that you're gonna talk about? So my patient had aqueous tear deficiency and inflammation. And so he was already on a topical anti-inflammatory. We have a few of those. And so my next step, given that he had persistent severe symptoms, was to start autologous serum tears. And that is something that is becoming more and more available to the eye care professional. For us, our eye bank is the one who processes them. And these are blood products from the patient that are then used to rehabilitate their ocular surface. And I've had really great success in especially patients with a Sjogren's-like dry eye. So I did that for my patient, but it wasn't good enough. And so the next thing I thought about was abnormal nerves. And in this case, the nerves are working a little more than they should because he was having pain. And this is something that we've talked about before that oftentimes ophthalmologists are frustrated with because some of these therapies may not be what we're comfortable with, but we need to get more comfortable. And so our patient, my patient, actually 
also had a diagnosis of fibromyalgia and was already on gabapentin. And so I upped the dose. And gabapentin, pregabalin, these are first-line treatments for neuropathic pain outside the eye. And they're not that hard to use. And the dose for gabapentin that I find helpful is 600 to 900 three times a day. So that's what I aimed for. In addition, we have lots of adjuvant therapies that we can use. And one of them are tinted lenses because many of these patients really complain of light sensitivity. But if they wear really dark glasses, then they get more sensitive to light when they take the glasses off. And so there are special tints that block out just the wavelengths that people are sensitive to and make the patient much, much more comfortable. So are, are, are these the, the, the HL41 pink tints, or are these the, the blue-blocking amber tints? So there are many different tints available, and you, know, you can personalize it. But the one I generally start with are the FL41, uh, FL41 yeah. uh, rose-colored glasses. I tell people, like, just the world takes a rose-colored tint. I mean, that's just a good thing in itself. The other thing that we've been using a lot of are tents. And TENS is a transcutaneous electrical stimulation. It's oftentimes used for chronic pain. And there's a new device that's FDA approved for migraine. And there's a lot of overlap between eye pain and migraine head pain. It's all the trigeminal nerve. And so these devices, it's a very small device that goes on your forehead. It kind of makes you look like Wonder Woman, which is something I think we all want to achieve. Tw I know I do. <laughs> that's right. 20 minute treatment before you go to bed at night. And the side effect, the main side effect is insomnia. Is, uh, is uh, helping you sleep, which most of my patients have insomnia. So they're very happy about this. And so the idea was is that this is a person who'd been having severe pain for years, dryness, burning, sensitivity to light, and through a multimodal therapy over a number of months was better. Not perfect, but better. And that's the other reality that we need to face. Patients need to understand it takes time, and we're not aiming to cure, we're aiming to manage. And when a patient tells me I'm good enough, and I look at their surface and I say I'm good enough, we're done. And so it takes the challenge of dealing with these patients that they can be very difficult, and really simplifying an approach to both the diagnosis and treatment to help both you and the patient. So did, did you work with the doctor managing the, the, the fibromyalgia for this, this patient? Right, so. I mean, I, I have never prescribed gabapentin for a, a patient. So one of my points was that we need a few best friends as cornea specialists. One of them is the oculoplastic surgeon. In this case, I didn't need to utilize it, but I often do. And the other person is a pain specialist. And I'm very lucky that I have a pain specialist who just loves the trigeminal nerve. And so I'm very supportive. Sometimes it takes time to form these partnerships, but I think it's worthwhile to find someone who can help you because it is very helpful to co-manage with people who can help with the other systemic complaints. That's really, really interesting. So um, I, I know from, um, from my patients and in conversations with, with, with you that um, I can see patients whom I would assume you would identify with at least a component of neuropathic pain uh, after, after cataract surgery. What, what are the, and you mentioned your patient with, with, with fibromyalgia. Who, who are the other demographics who are at particular risk for this, this etiology? So several studies have looked at that. Um, women are more likely to develop chronic pain than men, both outside the eye and in the eye. People with migraine, fibromyalgia, chronic pain elsewhere. It turns out pain kind of travels together, and there's some exciting research that maybe there's genetic predisposition to developing pain after surgery. And then evolution, from an evolutionary perspective, we weren't meant to live with chronic eye pain. And it actually incites a very robust emotional response. So our eyes are connected to our limbic system. So many of these patients come in with anxiety, depression, and I find that it's very helpful to, again, work with someone who can co-manage these complaints to make their overall symptomatology better. Oh, really, really interesting. What, what, is the, the gabapentin and uh, pregabalin pre therapies, uh, is that, is that op open-ended or is there a, a typical duration of, of treatment after which you, you stop it? So we don't know, but I can tell you that in my anecdotal experience, most of these patients have had surgery. Many of them have had refractive surgery. Mm -hmm. And what we find is we generally use, a, if, if we achieve effect, we'll leave it on for about a year. And now 
we've had more and more patients that have reached their year mark and we're starting to wean off and we're finding that we are able to wean patients off. And so the way I think about it is I think that these nerves are really hyperactive and we just want to give them peace for a long time. And after we've done that, we do try to back off and see if we can get patients either on lower doses or off the medication. And in some patients, we've been really successful at doing that. So I tell patients, think about it for a year, and then we start backing it off. Uh, really, really, really interesting. So the, 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 and the way you manage uh, the, the, this, this patient that you're bringing up now, really, really wonderful, and I'm worried that it's, it's above my, my capability, particularly for, for, for two reasons. I think that one of the, the barriers is, is that um, I don't have a relationship with a pain specialist, but I uh, may endeavor to develop one based on what you're saying. But the other thing is, is that how much chair time do, do you wind up with these patients? In, I'm not talking about the, the conversation and counseling that is, is the backbone of th therapy with, with a lot of these patients or a lot of my patients generally, but in, in working these patients up, how much time does this take? Well, you brought up two really good points. And if you don't want to take it on, that's absolutely okay. I think the important thing for most people to do is just recognize that nerves or abnormal nerves may be a problem in some patients that are coming in with dry eye. And I've had patients that come to me as the eighth ophthalmologist they've seen because it was the seventh that finally identified, hey, you may have a nerve problem. I don't manage it but go see someone else. Yeah. And they were so happy that finally someone gave it a name. So if you could be the first or second ophthalmologist to just let them know and then refer them to the right place, it takes a lot of the anxiety out of it. it in terms of the management, the chair time, the, the longest chair time is the first visit where we do a comprehensive but not that long of an exam, but more outline the goals of therapy. And once patients are educated, the next few visits, it's not as long. I would say that if you love it, you're absolutely able to integrate it into your practice. And if you're not, train yourself to think about nerves. And when you see a patient that fits, refer them to someone who does love it. This is wonderful, wonderful stuff. And I, I, I'm wondering now whether, you know, you, you, you've heightened my, my, my awareness and my interest, whether I'm, I'm going to discover that there are more of these patients in my practice than, than I think. That is yeah. what I've heard, that once you start thinking about it, you start seeing it more and more. Yeah. So I think that education, education of eye care providers and patients, it's the first step. So go back to your right patient's wife and tell her, dry eye is complex. Maybe your patients, your husband should come see me again. Yes, and by me. I mean you. Okay. <laughs> this is wonderful, wonderful stuff. Uh, you know, thank you very much for 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 bringing the, the, this um, uh, complex and increasingly getting more complex topic. Uh, I, I, I've enjoyed this this conversation. I've learned a lot, uh, and I know that um, we've only scratched the, the the surface, and that we're going to speak many more times. And that you're you're wonderful and wonderfully generous with your time, and I want to thank you for that. It is always a pleasure to sit here with you. Thank you.